Good morning. How are you guys this morning? Amen. Amen. As we go through the journey of life, we face many trials, many different things. And we just come to times that it just seems like there's no way. But Jesus seeks that our hearts will be healed and we will be filled with joy even through those trials. As we saw last night as Mark Hindi was sharing that the only way that we can really have that true joy in our lives and fulfill the mission that we have is if we stick to Jesus. And that's only done through the righteousness of Christ. Before I go any farther, if you could kneel with me for another word of prayer. My precious Heavenly Father, I am just grateful, so grateful that you use each one of us. And my Father, right now, I'm asking that you will draw nigh, that you will pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. Father, I'm asking that you will place your words in my mouth, that you will teach me what to say, that you will teach me how to speak. And Father, I'm asking for your guidance and that you will give me clarity. Father, I'm asking that you will just work in and through, and that I may be hidden behind your cross, and that you and you alone may be seen and may be glorified. Just want to thank you so much in the precious name of Jesus, our Redeemer, we pray. Amen. If you guys can turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 2, 2 Kings chapter 2, and beginning... In verse 15, 2 Kings chapter 2, beginning in verse 15. And when you guys get there, if you could say amen. Amen. And it reads, And when the sons of the prophets which were to view at Jericho saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. And they said unto him, Behold, now there be with thy servants fifty strong men. Let them go, we pray thee, and seek thy master, lest peradventure the Spirit of the Lord has taken him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. And when they urged him till he was ashamed, he said, Send. They sent therefore fifty men and sought three days, but found him not. So these sons of the prophets, they had known that Jesus, that Elijah was going to be taken up. They they continually were sharing with him as as shared yesterday, do you know your master's going to be taken away from you today? Yet, Now when Elisha comes back, they see the difference in Elisha. And they say, let's go check and see if we can find Elijah. They were basically saying, because if you notice in verse 16, it says, lest peradventure the spirit of the Lord, just in case the spirit of the Lord may have done something with him instead of taking him to heaven. They were distrusting Jesus. They were distrusting God. In a a time where it was very clear what God was doing. And sometimes we do this ourselves. We say, Lord, maybe maybe you just did this because, or maybe this isn't exactly your will when he's made it very clear to us. I want you to do this, or I don't want you to do this. 
but instead we're like, oh Lord, well maybe this. He's asking us to trust even if we misunderstand. Sometimes God gives us a clear no, yet we still ask, please Lord, I want this. As we see, they continued begging Elisha until he was just like, okay, go. So when we beg Jesus for something, if we continually beg when he has clearly said no, he will give it to us. But he knows what is best. He will not force us, but he has a better plan. Oh, if we would follow that plan. But Jesus does not just leave us. He doesn't leave us comfortless. He doesn't leave us in the sorrow of our mistakes. In verse 18, in 2 Kings chapter 2, and verse 18, it says, And when they came again to him, for he tarried at Jericho, he waited for them. He could have just said, you guys are wasting, are wasting your time. I'm not even going to stay here. But he stayed there. He stayed there to help there, to help them. He tarried at Jericho. And he said unto them, did not I say unto you, go not? It's a gentle rebuke. I told you that wasn't best. But you chose to go because they were so disappointed. What? We didn't find him. And he says, I told you not to go. When he lets us see the results of what we have gone into, it hurts sometimes. Jesus doesn't just leave us there. And continue on with me to verse 19. 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 19. And it says, And the men of the city said unto Elisha, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of this city is pleasant, as my Lord seeth, but the water is not and the ground barren. My friends, the men of the city went to Elisha, the man of God, because they saw that he alone he was the one that could solve their problem. They realized they could not fix it themselves. So they went to Elisha. To whom do we go when we are suffering trials? Do we go to our friends? Do we tell them all about what's happened? Can you believe so-and-so did this? Or do we go to Jesus? Come and help me. Because I cannot do this. Notice also, it says, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of the city is pleasant, but the water is not. My friends, sometimes here at OHC, OHA, we are in a pleasant place. It looks like a beautiful place to grow. We see other people growing. We see blessings on others. But sometimes in our own hearts, there's a dry barrenness. A, it seems like our relationship with God is going nowhere. Sometimes in the very place that is so pleasant, we have such dryness. It seems like our relationship with God is bearing no fruit. Sometimes it seems like we're forsaken and we ask, Lord, why is this person being blessed? Why didn't I receive anything? Where are you this morning in my devotions? Sometimes that is us. And we need to come to the Lord and ask him, can you heal my barrenness, my dryness? The water in my life is not Continue on with me to verse 20. Let's see how the waters were healed here and how Jesus heals our hearts. 
2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 20. And he said, bring me a new cruise or a bowl and put salt therein. And he brought it, and they brought it unto him. And he went forth unto the spring of the waters and cast the salt in there and said, thus saith the Lord, I have healed the waters. There shall not be from thence any more death or barren land. So Jesus, when we ask him to heal our problems, our, our sufferings, he comes directly to the source of the problem. He, just as Elisha did not go to the end of the river, which, what would the purpose of that be? <laughs> Elisha went to the spring. He went to where it started. And he placed the salt there that it may not just heal the spring itself, but the entire river. So Jesus with us. He comes to us when we ask him. And he goes to the source of the problem. He heals our hearts. He doesn't heal our hands. Praise the Lord for that, man. He heals our hearts. He sees beyond. We're saying, Lord, why am I constantly, say, lying or stealing or whatever it may be? We ask the Lord, why? And he says, your heart is not right. I want to heal your heart. But there's more significance to this. And if you can go with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And beginning in verse 13, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13. Because the question may come directly, what about the salt? Like, why did he use salt? He could have used anything. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13, it says, Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. We are to be the salt of the earth. We are to be a savor of life unto life to these people. The people need healing as well. God is sending us to heal his people. But if, what if we don't have our, that savor? What if we're just salt that's gone bad? I want to share a quote with you. And it comes from Prophets and Kings. Prophets and Kings, page 232. It says, the world needs evidences of sincere Christianity. The poison of sin is at work at the heart of society. Nigh and afar off are souls in poverty and distress. Weighed down with a sense of guilt and perishing for want of a saving influence. The gospel of truth is kept ever before them. Yet, they perish because the example of those who should be a savor of life is to them a savor of death. Their souls drink in bitterness because the springs are poisoned when they should be a well of water, springing up into everlasting life. Oh, my friends, what a sorry story it is if we who should be that spring of water, are instead a savor of death. Jesus wants to salt us so that we may salt them. He wants to cleanse us 
from unrighteousness so that the righteousness that he puts in us may heal those around us. We only gain that salt by spending time with Jesus. We can't gather up the salt ourselves. We can't. Just as the salt was poured into the water, it was, it was not by anything that the water did itself. Jesus pours the salt on our lives so that we can salt those around us. Go back with me to 2 Kings chapter 2. Second Kings chapter 2 and verse 21. And it says, And he went unto the source, or unto the spring of the waters and cast salt in there and said, Thus saith the Lord, I have healed these waters, and there shall not be from any from thence more any more death or barren land. What a promise is he has when Jesus has salted us, there will no longer be any more death, no more barrenness in us. Jump down with me to verse 23. Elisha continued, after healing the waters, Elisha continued to go on to another place. But we see a very interesting happening here. Here were hearts of people that were hurting. Read with me verse 23. And it says, and he went up from thence unto Bethel. And as he was going up by Bethel, or by the way, there came forth little children out of the city and mocked him and said, go up thou bald head. Go up thou bald head. These children had not learned to reverence Christ. They had not learned who God really was. And so they did not take seriously the calling of God's prophet. Instead, they mocked him, saying, oh, you think, Elisha, you think Elijah went up? Oh, why don't you? But my friends, we look at them and say, how could they be like that? How could these youth, I mean, don't they know what God did in the past? How could they do that? But, sometimes we're doing that in our own lives. When we come before the Lord, are we, are we seriously treating him as if he is really God? Do we come before him as our heavenly father or do we come before him as just a, oh, whatever? Do we give him the place that he must have in our lives? I wanna share with you from Prophets and Kings once again. A quote that really shares, when you see how Elijah reacted, it kind of throws you off. It says, Elisha was a man of mild and kindly spirit. Do we think, sometimes we think of mild and kindly spirit as the impossibility to be mean, or to, I mean, he was not really being mean in this situation. Well, we think of it as the, we think of it almost as overly nice. But as in 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 24, it says, And he turned back and looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Lord, and therefore came forth two 
she bears out of the wood and tear forty and two children of them. It is no small matter to mock God. Yet sometimes we are mocking God by being those waters. Those waters that are a savor of death to death to the people. When we are claiming, I am God, yet we are living in a way, we are giving an example of God is not really that important to me. In Prophets and Kings, speaking of this, it says, Elisha was a man of mild and kindly spirit, but that he could also be stern is shown by the chorus when on the way to Bethel he was mocked by ungodly youth who had come out of the city. These youth had heard of Elisha's ascension. They made this solemn event the subject of their jeers. Continuing on down it says, had Elisha allowed the mockery of to pass unnoticed, he would have continued to be ridiculed and reviled by the rabble, and his mission to instruct and save in a time of grave national peril might have been defeated. This is no small matter. If he had have left it, God would not have been able to work in the ways that he had. And the very mission may have been defeated. It says reverence is a grace that should be so carefully cherished. Every child should be taught to show true reverence for God. Never should his name be spoken thoughtlessly. Angels speak it with, angels as they speak it, veil their faces. With what reverence should we, who are fallen and sinful, take it upon our lips? With what reverence should we take the name of Jesus upon our lips? How are we representing Jesus? Are we, are we mocking God by our life? Are we taking his name and saying, oh, it doesn't matter. You can do whatever you want. You can be whoever you are. It doesn't matter. My friends, these these Hebrew youth, they came seeking to curse the man of God, but the curse fell upon them. If you guys can turn with me to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27 and verse 25. We see the parallel of Jesus and how this this very same thing happened in his life. And it says, Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. They were seeking to kill him, to curse Jesus. Yet, they ended up with his blood on their hands. Now we know that this can also be a promise for us, that his blood cleanses us. But that does not negate the fact that they, the curse fell upon them. Go with me to Mark, the book of Mark, Chapter 15, Mark chapter 15, and beginning in verse, Mark chapter 15, and beginning in verse 29. Just as the youth had, had just sought to curse Elisha, so we see 
people seeking to curse Jesus. In verse, in Mark chapter 15 and verse 29, it says, And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroyest the temple and builds it in three days. Save thyself and come down from the cross. And likewise also the chief priests, mocking, said to themselves, He saved others, himself he cannot save. Let Christ the King now descend from the cross, that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him reviled him. They were just finding every way to curse Jesus that they could think of. They were bringing everything up that they could come up with. But watch what happens in verse 33. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. This was midday. And it's like pitch black. They were noticing the signs of a curse here. They were like, oh no, what happened? What are we going to do? But it did not end up in there. Jump down with me to verse 38. It says, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. These, they were seeing the results of the curse come back on them. Jesus told them before it happened in Mark 14 verse 62 that they would see him coming on the right hand of power. They would see him coming in the clouds of heaven with their own eyes. I don't think that they were necessarily ready to realize what was going on. If you can go with me to Luke 20 and verse 17, the question is, will will you allow yourself to fall upon Jesus and your life be broken? broken, that you may be transformed into his his image? Or will you come to the point that because you've continually rebelled, you are broken? Luke 20 and verse 17 says, or sorry, verse 18, it says, Whomsoever shall fall upon that stone and be broken, shall be broken, but upon whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Are we willing to let Jesus take out of our hearts the rebellion, the seeds of evil, the lack of love for him, Are we willing to let him take that from us now so that it doesn't take us from him? There are only two groups of people when Jesus comes. And my friends, I pray that in this room there's only one group. Turn with me to Isaiah 25 and verse 9. I pray that this is each one of us. Isaiah 25 and verse 9. You can go there with me, and when you get there, you can say amen. Isaiah 25 and verse 9. And it says, and it shall be said in that day, lo, this is our God, we have waited for him. And he will save us. This is the Lord, we have waited for him. And we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. 
I pray that this is each of us. But my friends, if we do not let Jesus take from us the things that are separating us from him, we will end up in the other way. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 6 and verse 16. And this is sharing what the other camp will be. Revelation chapter 6 and verse 16. Because they have held something in their hearts that separates them from him, they say unto the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. My friends, We need now Jesus to take our hearts and to purify us into his image. So I want to make a couple of pills to you guys. Maybe your life, maybe you are that barren land. Maybe you're in the pleasant place. Maybe you see yourself, those around you growing, but you are not. Maybe you've come to the point where you just don't feel like there's hope. Every time it seems like you're failing. Maybe you've been struggling to surrender something to Christ. And it's just not seemed possible. My appeal to you today is that you will ask the Lord to salt your life that you may be a saver of life to those around you. Maybe in your life you have said one thing and been the other, but Jesus wants to take you into his image. If that is you, if you want to ask the Lord to take away the barrenness in your life, would you join me in standing? (coughs) My friends, my second appeal, maybe you've been asking the Lord to give you something and you're unwilling to surrender to him that it's not his will. Maybe you've been consistently begging for something, or maybe you've come to the point where you've asked, and you've continually asked, and God has said, okay, go ahead. And you've come to the point of sorrow where you see your ways didn't work. And you're asking the Lord to heal your heart, to make you into his image, and to help you to stand faithful, even when it seems like he doesn't know what he's doing. I want to ask, if this is you, I want to ask you to come forward. That you may be healed, and that you may trust him no matter what happens. Christ isn't asking us to just trust him in in the big things. He wants us to trust him when it seems like, no, that's not right. Amen. Now, I want to ask that we may join in groups of two really quick as we close with prayer. So continuing coming forward, we want to seal our decisions to trust the Lord fully, that he may live in us and heal our hearts, that we may be his fully. Let us pray. So join in groups of two for just a couple minutes and then I will close off.
My precious Heavenly Father, as the prayers are finishing, we just want to lift up our decisions to you that you will heal our hearts that we may heal others. Father, we are asking that you will transform us into your image, that we may be salt and a savor of life unto life to everyone that we come in contact with. We are tired of mocking you with our life and our ways. And we want you to have full control. We want to surrender all to you. We want to trust you even when we can't see the way and it just seems like that's the opposite of where we ought to go. We want you to be our leader every moment. We want to thank you for your faithfulness and guiding in our life. And we want to ask that you will teach us to abide with you moment by moment. We just want to thank you so much in the precious name of Jesus, our beloved Redeemer, we pray. Amen.